Great. All right. So very excited for today's topic. Uh, this is a topic that uh, I have uh, uh, shared in, in previous uh, conferences, but it always keeps evolving and it keeps evolving really, really fast. So today we're going to be diving into the state of production machine learning in 2023. There's going to be a broad range of topics that we're going to cover on a very high level because uh, these have been topics that have been covered in previous uh, conference talks. So what you will find is you will find actually references that will allow you to dive deeper into each of these topics. So pretty much a slide will you know, consume your entire weekend uh, on a rabbit hole learning about it, uh, uh, hopefully for the good. Um, a little bit about myself, uh, so my name is Alejandro. Uh, I am currently Director of uh, Technology at Zalando. Uh, I'm also a, a Scientific Advisor at the Institute for Ethical AI and Governing Council Member at Large at the ACM. So as I mentioned, there's gonna be a couple of links uh, uh, that you can dive into. So this is from previous talks that I have done, but also uh, interesting references that you can check. Uh, so you can find the slides on that top corner. Uh, so yeah, uh, please, uh, you won't have to take uh, all the pictures uh, and keep them. You can actually access uh, the slides. Um, so what we're gonna be diving into today is uh, five uh, key uh, uh, sections, starting with motivations and challenges. Why do we care about production machine learning? Uh, then we're going to dive into some trends that have been emerging in industry and also uh, on, in academia and, and in society as a whole. We're going to be then diving a bit deeper into the technology. And then we're going to be looking at the organizational considerations themselves as well. So by the end of this talk, um, you should have an intuition of the you know, very high level societal uh, 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 implications and considerations, but also how that reflects into the technology and then bringing uh, some insights that you would be able to not only uh, uh, um, add into your tech stack, but also into your teams and into your organizations, hopefully. So starting with the motivations and challenges. So one of the things that has become crystal clear is that the life of the machine learning models uh, does not finish once they are trained, right? Like that's uh, uh, only the beginning. And it's only when you actually start consuming those models and really getting value out of those machine learning models and more specifically machine learning systems as we will see today, you'll start seeing challenges that you are not going to, to, to see when you are in your experimentation phase, right? You're gonna see things like you know outliers, you're gonna see uh, drift. From the moment that the model hits production, you already see a degrade that has uh, 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 to involve certain considerations, right? So as part of that, this is going to be uh, one of the, of the core principles uh, that we're gonna be fleshing out. Uh, but we need to ask the question of, well, why is production machine learning so challenging? What are some of the key areas that make it not only difficult, but also different to traditional software, right? Um, so some examples that may be different to traditional software microservices are that there is specialized hardware, right? So when it comes to the productionization of models, you have to involve not just uh, special accelerators like GPUs, TPUs, but also in some cases, very large amounts of uh, memory, right? For example, models that, that uh, 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 require a lot of RAM or a lot of uh, uh, VRAM. Uh, you also require uh, perhaps uh, special compute. Uh, and as part of that, that involves complexity in the orchestration uh, of your models themselves as you, know, you reach harder scale, uh, larger scale. Uh, there are complex data flows, right? It's not just about the model itself and the inputs and the outputs, but it's uh, potentially the impact that uh, considerations can have up the stream or down the stream, right? Uh, there are compliance requirements, particularly when it comes to machine learning. It tends to be also very, very tightly closed uh, into the uh, domain use cases, which means that often there are uh, a lot of uh, compliance requirements uh, and in some cases even ethical requirements uh, when it comes to the productionization of machine learning systems. And then uh, another area is the reproducibility of components, right? It's not just the deployment of the, of the application of the code, but it's that combination of code uh, plus environment plus artifact, right, and then the, 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 the versioning of that and making sure that you're able to have that reproducibility so that, um, you know, you can introduce that determinism into your, into your environment, right? Uh, so if you want to dive deeper again, you know, these are the, the links uh, that you can find for, for talks that actually, in this case, talk specifically about the challenges. Um, but then going one level higher, you know, why is production machine learning so challenging at even the societal level, right? And this is uh, part of the point that it goes close towards that use case uh, um, specific area. 
There are challenges that you may have heard already, particularly in high profile cases uh, in the news around algorithmic bias, right? Uh, <clears throat> whether it is uh, discrimination uh, due to undesired bias within the, within the models. Uh, and that in itself, again, you know, there is a, a very interesting uh, field uh, uh, that, that you can delve into to understand about that explainability, interpretability, bias. Um, there is also the challenges that you have in traditional software, which is basically software outages, right? What happens when, when your actual infrastructure falls down? Uh, there's the misuse uh, or the challenges that come with the data itself. And then there is an element of cybersecurity, which we are going to be diving into, and that it's exciting to see that there's a lot of topics that are coming up now, especially in this conference. There are a couple of exciting talks on, on cybersecurity. And then, of course, you know, it couldn't be a state of production ML without the LLMs. Um, but this in itself, um, you know, doesn't really change the whole uh, challenges that machine learning introduces. But I think you will see as part of the examples that I will be giving in this talk, it makes them a little bit more intuitive, right? And it makes the need for this production machine learning considerations more clear. So I think that's, that's the one thing that has been, you know, brought uh, beyond the hype that we will benefit from. And this includes uh, complex architectures uh, that will be described as this uh, data-centric view of machine learning that involves multiple components, right? You have seen most likely when it, when it comes to the world of applications on LLMs that you would see the use of machine learning models in ways that are very creative, right? The machine learning model interacting with APIs, interacting with databases, and then bringing the, the, the prediction together with that, that combination. So, so it... Uh, will kind of like give you an intuition of some of those challenges. Now, in order for us to tackle those challenges, it also involves some considerations of the skills required uh, for those uh, challenges, right? And this is something that, that has now become a little bit more uh, ubiquitous um, and standardized and understood, is this intersection of the skills between software engineering, data science, and DevOps or, or, or platform engineering, which is basically the skill set of machine learning engineers or MLOps engineers. So this skill set is something that has now become even more prevalent within uh, data science teams as, as their uh, requirements and um, product, uh, productionization grows. And we will actually touch upon that in the organizational shapes uh, in a bit. But then there's also not just an intersection of uh, skills, but it's an intersection of domains themselves, right? So you have the intersection of the knowledge required within the machine learning expertise, but also the industry domain expertise, and then as we will see as well, that policy expertise, right? Is how do you make sure that, of course, you're doing it correctly from a t technological sense, but also that you're aligned with the industry uh, requirements and then aligned with the higher level uh, considerations. Um, but one thing that, that we will see as well is how, how to think about this, right? Because right now it's very, very abstract. So for that, now let's dive into some industry and domain trends, right? So we're going to go a little bit uh, deeper, uh, still very high level. We have been seeing that, and this is something that I, I really liked, how it was verbalized by the Linux Foundation, is that we started with uh, this uh, description of AI ethics, you know, perhaps in like, 2015 to uh, you know 2018. Then we went into uh, responsible AI, uh, uh, which is basically okay. Let's discuss the, the higher level. Then let's discuss the best practices. And now we're talking more about accountable AI, right? So how do we actually um, hold people accountable? Introduce whether it's through regulation, through policy, through standards, things that allow us to understand what best practice looks like and what should be the bare minimum in some uh, areas. So in this case, you know, the way to think about it from a hierarchical perspective, you of course have those very high level principles and guidelines that give you that North Star. But then from that, you have to uh, get a little bit more concrete. What are those industry standards, those regulatory frameworks, those even organizational policies to be compliant for certain requirements? But then similarly, uh, what is absolutely critical is not just to have those North Star principles, but is to make sure that those open source frameworks that are now become uh, ubiquitous within industry and academia, um, they are also by design aligned for those principles, right? Because, uh, you know, in essence, we can have as many round tables as, as we want, and we can all agree that discrimination is bad, but if the underlying infrastructure and the foundation is not um, uh, uh, enabling this by design and it's not built with those considerations in order for, the, for them to be empowered, then, you know, we're not going to be able to achieve uh, what we are setting out to. And similarly, if we actually see it from an organizational st standpoint, the thing to, to emphasize as well is that large ethical challenges or even large compliance challenges should not fall on the shoulders of a single 
data scientist or, or, or on the shoulders of a single software engineer, right? Because of that, it is not just required for individuals to be responsible, right? Because also one thing that uh, you know we have seen in the past is that it, you can have a situation where you know a group of individuals are all responsible or ethical, let's say, uh, but then the outcome as a whole may not be. Right? And that doesn't mean that people were just sitting there thinking, how can I build the most you know, racist algorithm that I can possibly do, right? And you know, when we've seen that in the, in the high profile cases in the news, I hope that that's not what you know, the, the people are thinking, but I, uh, most likely it isn't, right? And, and that emphasizes that it's not just about the individuals, it's about the compound. So what that means is, you know, of course, from a personal perspective, having that sort of technology best practices, being able to work in the areas where, where your competence is, is relevant, uh, having those uh, you know, areas of professional responsibility, like the ACM has a, a code of ethics and, and professional responsibility that you know, we always kind of uh, recommend and point to, because you know, it's, it's also from, from the ACM. But then broader, broader to this, you also have the team, right? And how you make sure that there's that cross-functional uh, skill set that uh, balances each other, how you have the key domain experts, how you have like the relevant uh, alignment within that. And then at an organizational level, it's also important, how do you introduce the relevant touch points, human touch points, that ensure that the you know respective domain experts, most likely in several cases non-technical, will be able to provide that uh, you know, human uh, 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 decisioning, right? And, and, and ensuring that that accountability can be distributed uh, as opposed to just you know, uh, uh, ensuring that there's just a single, single individual accountable. And of course, you know, one thing that has now become a little bit more real is, uh, and that you know, it's, it's, it's really interesting to see, is that before we were talking about how regulation was playing catch up, um, but now it is tech companies playing catch up with some of the regula regulation that is being rolled out. So recently we actually submitted a, a contribution to a consultation for the European uh, Union's uh, AI Act, uh, which is going to you know, come to force in a couple of years. So now actually companies are thinking, how, do we, how are we going to, to, to roll this out? Like how are we gonna introduce the processes uh, similarly, with uh, you know the the the, the other regulation uh, that that the other regulations in the EU, but we're seeing similar things in other parts, like in the UK. Uh, again, we submitted for their current initiative for they call it the Innovation uh, First uh, AI Regulatory Framework, um, and for that they're also looking and thinking how can we achieve uh, the best practices being rolled out within the organisations whilst encouraging innovation, right? So it's it's really kind of uh, uh, having a balance of of both areas. And again, this is to emphasize, back to the point that I mentioned, but making more of a call to action to the people in this room, right? That, of course, we can have all of these, you know, regulatory frameworks, all of these principles, but really it is, um, you know, the foundation that now actually runs uh, a, a large percentage of our society, these open source frameworks, not just machine learning frameworks, but also just general software frameworks, that are required uh, for you know, individuals like ourselves to be involved in this discourse, right? Because we are really guiding and supporting uh, how these uh, best practices or how these uh, mitigations of bad practice are, are, are formed and rolled out in society. So, I mean, and the ways to get involved as well, I mean, ultimately uh, are, are as simple as just attending conferences like this, but also getting involved with open, uh, working groups uh, like from um, you know the, the, the Linux Foundation or, or the ACM. Um, so that's something that, that definitely would be a call to action for anyone that would like to get involved in, in those. So now, actually, let's go a level deeper into the technological trends and uh, you know some of the, 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 the tools and frameworks that have been growing uh, within uh, the ecosystem. So yeah, I mean, just as a refresher, you know, back in the day, you know, this is how it started, right? Like simple, uh, you know, uh, you could just pick and choose, and it was it was easy. But now it's a little bit harder, right? We have a, a very very large uh, tool set, and I think since the since the rise of LLMs, it's like one every hour, <laughs> pretty much, right? So 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 yeah. So so the question of how to navigate, I mean, now what what I do want to highlight here is a bit of a of a plug. Um, of one of the, the, the frameworks that we actually uh, maintain. So this is one of the, the awesome production machine learning frameworks in GitHub. Uh, and actually, uh, we are celebrating its fifth year uh, and we just uh, broke uh, 14,000 stars. So, uh, you know, our call to action is not to just, you know, go and, and, and add more stars unless you want to, but uh, to actually add PRs and, and add anything that is missing. We are a little bit more strict on what is added now because, you know, otherwise it would be like enormous. Uh, but definitely, if you're interested, like this would be a, a great also way for you to discover uh, new areas, right? Like diving into into tools. Um, 
but yeah, so, so, so now putting a little bit kind of like into a shape uh, this, this, this set of frameworks, uh, if we want to like uh, get an understanding of what is the anatomy of production machine learning, right? So the way, to, the way that like, uh, I'd like to think about it, so let's think about basically this, this sort of production uh, blueprint where we have the training data, the artifacts, or the train models, and then some inference data. Uh, we start basically on the experimentation where we train models uh, through that training data, uh, doing sort of like whether it's a workflow manager or a notebook, uh, ETL or just a notebook, to generate train models, right? From that, we want to um, do something with these trained models. We want to be able to make them available for consumption. So we would be able to do them either manually uh, by, you know, creating, like publishing our, our Jupyter notebook. Don't do that. Or by uh, properly, you know, productionizing your, your machine learning models uh, uh, into, you know, an environment uh, with basically, in this case, your offline or real-time or semi-real-time machine learning models. Um, ultimately, also introducing uh, observability and monitoring, things like drift detection, outlier detection, and um, uh, in production, observing basically uh, inference data, right? Like running inference on, on unseen data, data points, um, ultimately with the, um, the objective to be able to make use of that inference data at some point, whether it's for training data or for analytics, there are some, some, some relevant use cases. And of course, the metadata that actually interoperates around this is something that you know, would uh, uh, make the whole picture of this uh, uh, you know, anatomy of production machine learning. So one of the things that we have also been seeing is now looking at this as just an architectural blueprint, if we look at the question of, well, okay, what frameworks can I pick and choose there? And what we're seeing is that there has been a conversion, uh, uh, or, or yeah, convergence into the concept of a canonical stack, right? It's basically having elements or, or, or sections or, or, or little kind of like uh, placeholders uh, that serve for particular uh, outcomes, right? Like your experiment tracking, your data versioning, your experimentation, your model registry, your monitoring, right? And as part of that, you have an ability to choose different uh, frameworks. So now what we start thinking about is how do we then um, encapsulate those components and think about, in a way, standards that we expect frameworks to be able to have so that we don't end up in a world where, you know, just everything is completely different and we end up kind of like with different standards that create more standards, right? And we're going to touch upon that. This actually is a very interesting tool that you can use to just, you know, pick and choose your, 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 your frameworks. But now there's actually starting to be a little bit more convergence, which is interesting to see. Like, there's starting to be a bit more preference to certain tools and certain combinations of tools, also depending on the scale of the projects. Another trend that we're seeing is that people are starting to also realize, or, well, I mean, realize and also put a name to it, that when we talk about production machine learning, we no longer talk about the production model, right? We actually talk about a production system. And what that basically means is that we stop thinking about this model-centric machine learning, and we start thinking about this data-centric machine learning, right? Is the question of how does your data flow, what are the transformations of the data as they go through your system? And of course, you know, here uh, is an example of uh, uh, a um, architecture of the uh, uh, Facebook search. So I actually cut the, uh, yeah, here's the diagram. So here you can see that there's actually an offline and an online uh, uh, um, sort of section. So basically training the, the embeddings and then being able to use them. And you see that there's multiple stages, right? As part of this, there's not just going to be multiple machine learning models, but there's going to be multiple versions of those models, multiple uh, relations to the training data, and multiple components that are not machine learning related, right? So when we think about this machine learning system, it's important um, to, to understand, like, what does that mean in terms of intuition? Because when you look at something like this Facebook search, I mean, maybe it's a little bit abstract. This is where we can go back to what I was suggesting in terms of LLMs providing a more intuitive picture. And I think right now, when we start seeing this agent chain architectures of how people are thinking to deploy a LLM that then interacts with, let's say, another API, or that then interacts with a database. So that in itself is a, in a way, partially a data-centric machine learning system where you are expecting multiple multiple flows of interaction, right? And I mean, there is there is of course, uh, 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 you know, increasing complexity depending on on how large is the system. But the way to also think about it is that each of these components will also uh, introduce the challenges that we, uh, you know, revised at the beginning and will benefit from the production machine learning um, considerations that we will talk about, right? All of this uh, monitoring, metadata management, 
every single component is something that you'll have to consider as part of your, your machine learning system. But yeah, so this is just another topic that you know you can spend an entire weekend. Well, I mean, people spend their entire PhDs and, and careers just, just on that. But you know, the, all of these areas are, 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 are definitely very interesting uh, to dive into. So um, another thing to, to take into consideration, so uh, as part of these machine learning systems, we also want to understand what are some of the relationships between the components, right? And we, I mean, probably most people here have actually come across the concept of a model registry, right? Like uh, an ability to be able to, um, you know, keep track of your trained machine learning models. But when it comes to production machine learning, we actually introduce a new paradigm that has to uh, 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 bring new sort of like uh, method, um, uh, new, new considerations, right? And let's actually see that intuitively. Let's say that we have a data set, uh, so instances for data set A, so we have basically all of these instances uh, that we then use to train a model, right? So we run an experiment, we train model artifact A1, right? We train artifact uh, all the way to AM, right? So we have basically a data set that we are using different parts to train basically different models within an experiment. But then we also may have other model artifacts that come from different data sets. That in itself is your artifact store, right? But then what happens when you productionize your models, right? You productionize your models, let's say you productionize uh, your artifact AM, um, and you are productionizing it with certain configuration, right? Then you may actually productionize it again with in another environment with a different configuration, right? And then we, you may actually productionize a combination of these models as a pipeline or as a, as a data flow uh, component, right? So as part of, you know, this introduces considerations that in your traditional um, artifact stores you're not fully capturing. And as part of that, you do have to, um, you know, make sure that those things are, are um, um, considered when it comes to your production environment, right? Because if something goes wrong with model AM, right? then something will happen as part of your pipeline, then something you know, will have to be debugged and you'll have to consider with that uh, uh, second model and you will have to understand kind of like the whole picture, then bring in the relevant experts, you know, who trained model B1, right? Who trained model a AM? Uh, but yeah, ultimately this is just for an intuition, uh, so hopefully it doesn't confuse you a bit more uh, for the next section. And this next section is, is, is saying basically, okay, wait, so we have multiple models in production that have sort of uh, multiple considerations in this uh, um, uh, sort of machine learning system. Now, as part of each of those components, you will have also to introduce the best practices around how do you keep track of them, right? It's how do you know when something goes wrong? And this is basically by introducing things that, you know, in traditional software would be just monitoring, right? And traditional, moni traditional software monitoring would be things like what is the request per second or what, what is the, the throughput of, of your service, what is the current CPU usage, what is the G GPU, well, uh, uh, RAM usage, right? And suddenly it crashes, you start seeing the, 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 the chart and then you see that there's like a consistent chart and then you realize that there's a memory leak and then you, know, you go and address it, right? But in machine learning, there are further considerations when it comes to monitoring for each of these components, right? It's, uh, monitoring of things like statistical model performance, right? Like, what is the accuracy of your model in production? What is the precision? What is um, the recall of your model in production? And in order to answer those questions, there is an element of data labeling, right? Like, that you have to know what are the actual what are the actuals uh, in your production environment. So that introduces basically the questions of how do you then, um, you know, bring that into your production environment and monitor that. There's also uh, uh, things like explainability, right? How do you make sure that whenever there's a prediction, you can explain what happened as part of that prediction? That in itself is another you know, area of uh, you know, uh, uh, research that has some really interesting approaches. Uh, and then also the, the question that we were discussing about, well, as part of your inference data, you may also want to get some insights, right? What, is, what are the distributions of your production data? What is basically uh, perhaps use cases that you can bring into the organization from your inference data, right? So, so, so those things are, 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 are considerations that go beyond uh, the traditional um, uh, monitoring of software. And then similarly, how do you introduce observability on top of that, right? So things like SLOs, uh, uh, so service level objectives, alerts, uh, um, uh, SLIs for, your, for indicators, so that you don't have to just be checking on the model in the dashboard, but you can have uh, you know, uh, 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 pagers for your team so that they can be notified whenever actually there's a problem. Um, so, so, and then finally, things like you know, drift detection, outlier detection, that you can introduce as part of your, your stack. But again, so, so you know, each of these each of these areas is probably like you know a, a deep dive in itself that you can actually check out in one of the talks that we gave uh, last year on 
production machine learning monitoring, uh, which is interesting in itself. Now, another consideration uh, to take into account is the challenge of security, right? So this is, uh, this is something that comes up a lot when it comes to traditional software. But in machine learning, it's not something that is discussed as much. So when you think about uh, uh, security, the first question is, where is security relevant, right? Like what part of the machine learning life cycle do I have to think about security? Is it on the data processing? Is it in the model training? Is it in the model deployment? Or is it on the monitoring, right? And the reality is that it's basically like across all, right? I mean, well, that's supposed to be like a red line across all, but you can see it well. But yeah, so it's basically saying like every single part of, and every single stage of your machine learning life cycle is susceptible to vulnerabilities, right? And it's something that now uh, uh, the community is starting to think uh, and ask the question of, well, what vulnerabilities? What does that mean, right? Um, so as part of that, we actually have uh, uh, started doing some uh, initiatives exploring the security risks of machine learning, right? And actually, I mean, if you, if you do want to get involved, we are running a uh, committee as part of the Linux Foundation on machine learning security, where we are really uh, trying to explore what are some challenges within, within security. Examples of this would be challenges and risks on the model artifacts, right? Basically, uh, potential injection of, uh, uh, within, within uh, the binaries, which I, I think there's gonna be actually a talk uh, on that. Uh, yeah, on poison pickles, I think it is. Uh, so do check that out. Um, challenges of accessing to the model, being able to reverse engineer the models and exploit them. Um, challenges of dependency or supply chain attacks, being able to inject in the dependencies. Uh, challenges within the infrastructure that the model runs. But ultimately, I mean, of course, this is a, a, a long running list. The main thing to, to, to think about in this, in this specific area is that as machine learning practitioners, there is an element of security that um, in certain uh, uh, extent, you don't have to 100% you know, care about uh, all the time and try to kind of like you know, address it every single time just because we can't make every single data scientist also cybersecurity experts. But ultimately is to think about in the, uh, from a holistic sense, similar to how it's introduced in the software development life cycle, right? So how you have traditional S uh, SDLCs that we will see in a bit. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's basically some, some trends when it comes to the, to the uh, uh, security side. Now, as part of the last area, now let's talk about teams and organizations. So how does this look like when it comes to my team, to my organization? How can I roll this out if I was to bring this to, 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 to kind of like my area, right? Uh, the first thing is that we are starting to see a trend um, where basically this concept of SDLC, so software development life cycle, which like organizations tend to adopt and tend to roll out. Basically now you don't find organizations, or well, I mean, uh, not very common to find organizations that are putting stuff in production without an operations team, like a DevOps team with CICD, with like, you know, uh, uh, testing, et cetera, et cetera, right? So, but when it comes to machine learning and this concept of the machine learning development life cycle, it's a little bit different because you cannot just roll out something that is the same across every single um, use case, right? Because different use cases will also have a different level of risk, and also different use cases will have a different tech stack, right? Some machine learning you know, teams may be much more analytics uh, um, um, heavy, uh, as in from, from uh, analysts uh, that are performing, you know, uh, uh, that are using uh, 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 like analyst stacks, uh, something that is, uh, uh, you know, perhaps more higher level versus uh, something that is a little bit kind of more machine learning engineering uh, that involves productionization, that involves real time uh, inference. So there are different considerations at the, te at the tech stack level, but also at the domain level in terms of the risk, right? Some may actually, uh, uh, involve heavy compliance requirements, others may not, right? So when it comes to this uh, MLDLC, it becomes more of a framework to adopt uh, best practices that are relevant for, for, the, for the context. Now, as part of that, you know, we talked about uh, a little bit uh, in terms of the components, but something that we're seeing as well as part of trends in the organizations is the concept of metadata itself, right? Now we have different components, different systems, different frameworks, some that are doing our, our model versioning, some that are doing our model artifacts, some that are doing our model serving. How do we make sure that we have lineage across all of this so that you know that if something went uh, uh, wrong in production, even at a compliance level, you can actually go back into the training side to understand uh, you know, perhaps what is the, the, the linkage between both. And this is harder said than done, ultimately, because when it comes to metadata, um, 
you know, it, it also often involves standards to be able to ensure that it's uh, homogeneous enough that it can be processed and that can be handed over in a way, right? So what we're starting to see is that there's standards that are, st that are, that are trying to standardize standards, right? So uh, what we want is to also make a bit of a call, call to action um, to not do that, <laughs> right? And try to kind of like contribute to, to potentially existing ones uh, um, uh, that, and, and try to even as, as, as um, open source project uh, leads, if they are uh, uh, present in, in, in this uh, uh, room, to also think about how can I standardize and, and, and bring um, alignment into this uh, uh, broader ecosystem. So, but it, this actually in itself is an interesting one. And again, there's a talk uh, that was actually uh, two years ago on meta ops. So, I mean, it sounds more boring than it actually is. It's actually pretty interesting, or uh, I'd like to think that. But um, yeah, do check it out if you're, if you're interested. And then finally, uh, the last couple of things to mention is that um, you know people in the in the data space uh, would have heard of this you know uh, buzzword of data ops and data meshes. So we're now starting to see a bit of a convergence between this MLOps space and the data mesh uh, concept, which is basically uh, thinking about uh, even MLOps not as a single sort of centralized data lake where everything just gets put there, but as something that actually interoperates and is closer to the domain and that serves kind of uh, uh, multiple different uh, domain-specific expertise, but also has an ability to like interoperate on that. So that, that in itself is another interesting area that, that I definitely recommend diving deeper, this intersection of data mesh uh, and, and MLOps. Now, when it comes to the, the, the products themselves, we need to also th uh, start thinking and having a mind shift of machine learning as products themselves, right? Not just as projects. So ultimately, them having roadmaps that don't, you know, that, that, that involve that sort of feature improvement, incremental improvement perspective that has been uh, ubiquitously adopted in the software space, right? Is really kind of uh, uh, seeing this, 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 this um, machine learning, uh, machine learning uh, uh, initiatives as, as products that would also involve that product uh, uh, mindset when it comes to that, like refining, delivering value, iterating. And that similar thing is also reflected into the mindset that we're seeing within organizations, is thinking about their machine learning also as these product roadmaps, right? So you have the investment at the infrastructure level, the investment at the tooling, and then the investment at the actual value delivery for businesses. But how does this map into each other, and how does this actually uh, you know, become kind of this product mindset? How do you iterate from, from those things? And then finally, this is the same thing for teams. We're starting to see this concept of squads, coming into the machine learning space, this cross-functional, um, you know, um, feature-driven, uh, iterative uh, uh, um, combinations of, of uh, you know, researchers, uh, uh, but also engineers that are delivering value uh, as, as they would with, with, with a product. Uh, and similarly, see, starting to see the, the rise of this um, uh, machine learning product managers and program managers that, you know, organizations are starting to, to really uh, standardize towards. Now, uh, a couple of uh, final things from an organizational perspective is that also you have to take into consideration that when it comes to all of these uh, uh, elements that we are talking about, this will come as your complexity increases, right? So it's not a big bang that you should just start with all of this complex infrastructure and bring in the full wrath of Kubernetes and, and you know, bring in like everything like scalable for a billion users from day zero. Uh, but instead, it's actually thinking about this in an iterative way, right? As you start uh, bringing more, um, you know, a few models. Uh, you know, the common thing to see is a combination of data scientists, data analysts. As more models start coming in, we start seeing that machine learning engineers start coming into the picture because otherwise, you know, data scientists just end up with a lot of the operational uh, burden. And then as there is an increase of that, there is this sort of more specialized machine learning platform engineering uh, roles. And then you start seeing also that uh, increase of those elements of uh, automation, standardization, control, security, observability. And then similarly, the way that we think about it in this sort of like product mindset, when you have basically the, 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 the group of data scientists, you may have them focused on a particular use case. But this, this product mindset is to think about how you can enable uh, those uh, uh, data scientists to be able to deliver value in a way that uh, increases without having to also increase the headcount, right? Like not, not requiring that linear growth in terms of the number of people with the number of models or the number of the, the amount of value that you're delivering. And as part of that, that is when you start seeing that automation, right? Like pipelines are, are, are introduced so that the, 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 the um, science experts are able to start, you know, creating value and repeatable value. And then as, as it starts becoming kind of like more and more uh, 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 sort of um, 
uh, as you start incre increasing this sort of like product perspective, then you start being able to increase even the 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 level uh, or the higher level in which it's operating, right? So then it's actually uh, data analysts or even business uh, stakeholders that are interacting with this data and uh, machine learning products to to carry out uh, the the outcomes. Um, so yeah, so that's that's ultimately yeah the the, the main uh, um, um, areas uh, that I want to highlight. Just to wrap up, one thing to remember. And this is very important, right? Is that from all of the problems in the world, right? There's a very, very small chunk that actually are solvable and should be solvable with machine learning, right? So when you're running with a hammer, everything uh, looks like a nail, right? So uh, we have to remember that the first question is whether machine learning is actually relevant. Uh, most often and statistically, the answer is no, right? So um, yeah, that's just something to, to keep in mind. And also the last thing is that we have to remember that as practitioners, uh, you know, we do have a big uh, impact. And and we have a lot of potential uh, uh, to drive value and change within this space, right? Because a uh, large and growing amount of critical infrastructure is, re is depending on machine learning systems that we are you know, developing, that we are uh, 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 maintaining. Um, and always the impact is going to be human, irrespective of the number of abstractions and, 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 and data products and machine learning products. So that's always something to, to, to remember. So yes, with that said, it was a lot of content, but I'm glad that uh, everybody's still awake, I think. Uh, so thank you very much, and I'll take some questions now, and maybe more in the pub later. Thank you. Amazing, thanks so much, Eleanor. That was, that was riveting, honestly. Um, so there's definitely a question. So I'll, I'll roaming mic, but there's also stationary mic. Hi, um, what do you think is the optimal team size in the future when you are running machine learning products in a company? Is it more like a hierarchical structure or is it more independent teams? No, that, that is a great question. I mean, I don't think there's, there's a, a, a silver bullet number, but what, what we started to see is that there was more of a ratio. And what we start seeing is, is basically that ratio of, um, not even to say number of, of data scientists, to number of machine learning engineers, to number of uh, machine learning operations or platform engineers, but also to the um, outcomes that these are, are providing. So it's similar to when it comes to the questions of how many um, you know, software engineers or how many engineers uh, would you want in an organization. Uh, I think it also becomes a bit more of a ratio uh, that ultimately is to the infrastructure and to the overhead. Um, the, the trend that we tend to see is that machine learning engineers are included once the data scientists are just getting overwhelmed on just doing operations and engineering, and they are no longer actually doing data science. Um, so yeah, I would say it's more of a ratio from what we see than a specific number. Thank you. Thank you for the great talk. Uh, my question is uh, regarding the new generative AI that's emerging and all the services, you know, AI as a service that appears and the high quality of what we see. Do you think that's a threat for AI researchers and data scientists in terms that uh, we can't build, like a regular data scientists cannot build something like GPT? Um, so just to make sure that I got your question. So is your question, um, that uh, you're seeing a lot of uh, innovations in the large language model or, the, or, or just like generative AI, and is your question about uh, researchers not being able to compete with that like amount of hardware that is, that is happening, or yes. is with the use cases that are coming out? With the use cases. I mean, uh, uh, in the past, when you need a new product, you hire some researchers, they build oh. it, and, and now you just get GPT. Right, okay, okay. Well, I mean, so I, I um, yeah, I'm a bit, a bit critical of, of all of this like uh, generative AI hype because I mean, there is certainly like an element of, of um, yeah, huge potential and huge value. Um, and there definitely will be a lot of uh, trans transformative elements uh, around it. But something that I have been seeing that is becoming a little bit more clear and more prevalent is that what is going, like, what is converging towards is not that you will end up with a complete automation of just researchers will just not exist and will not research like researchers or engineers or, or, or even like 
full stack engineers that are creating uh, products, but is that uh, those domains will evolve and the practitioner, um, the practice will act, will be um, acting at a significantly higher level, right? So they will uh, become experts in building something along those lines, and we're already seeing that, right? In those um, sort of complex um, uh, agent chain architectures that I was talking about, that starts delving into the concept of this uh, data flow machine learning, uh, where I would say the 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 more boring and uh, traditional best practices of, of, of MLOps becomes even crystal clear, uh, you know, critical, right? And that means that the jobs for machine learning engineers, machine learning operations, platform engineers, I mean, they're, they're gonna be there. And, and also like for data scientists, I think. Um, but yeah, it is exciting. Um, there are, you know, still quite a while to go to really get it, get it right, I mean, from what I see, but, uh, yeah, that's my perspective. That it's that it's a little bit more of kind of like an evolution of profession. Yeah. Thank you for for the presentation. So, uh, can can you recommend, uh, for example, three frameworks that uh, help with running a machine learning pipeline in production? You know, top top three, your favorite. My top three. Um, so I mean, that would be a hard one. Uh, what I would point you to is is to have a look at the two things that I showed. The first one is the canonical stack, uh, because that will actually give you a lot of guidance uh, for each of the frameworks that are recommended and that are very popular. Um, and I will also recommend you to check out basically the the, the list of MLOps frameworks. Um, yeah, I don't think, I mean, yeah, it's how long is a piece of string? I mean, uh, what I would recommend, actually, there was this uh, article that uh, we shared in our newsletter uh, just last week, which was called uh, MLOps at Reasonable Scale. And they actually had a, a, a practical uh, MLOps pipeline end-to-end -end that was kind of like balancing on effort together with um, um, scale, uh, or scalability. So, yeah, I mean, that would be a good one to, to, to get started with. So, yeah, sorry for not giving like a very specific one, but you know, this should give you enough uh, for you to find the ones that are right for just playing around or actually bringing to your environment. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, no. Okay, we've got two minutes, so <laughs> can you do one minute on each of these questions? Hi, so I'm wondering, uh, I didn't see you talking about experimenting with models in, in production. Um, what do you think about practices there? Is there any, any good framework to follow? Um, so with experimentation, uh, what we see is mainly to have basically um, those considerations of experiment tracking, uh, artifact uh, management, uh, lineage of metadata. So I think, you know, really kind of following those uh, suggestions of the tools of the, of, the, of the canonical stacks gives you an intuition of what are the best practices that uh, need to be enforced uh, within them. Because, for example, the lack of having that uh, experimentation management tool or, 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 or model tracking tool would mean that, yeah, you just don't have uh, that best practice. So yeah, I would say probably along those lines, yeah. And then final question. Hi, thank you. Um, so I feel like in recent times there's this move from just data scientists to machine learning engineers doing like end to end. Um, so I'm just wondering what do you think about that? Will we move from a machine learning engineer which is able to do both a data gathering, machine learning, um, developing the model and then implementing it or you'll see all the different positions still existing? Yeah, I mean, so like with a full stack engineer in the traditional software engineering that does, you know, front and back end, uh, I think, you know, in, in earlier stage products uh, and even earlier stage startups, you may find uh, individuals that may actually master both and be unicorns and be able to do all of them. But what we are starting to see is more uh, consolidation towards a uh, specialized skill set. So still with the data scientists, of course, getting a little bit more of that uh, engineering acumen. Uh, that is definitely a trend, but ultimately the machine learning engineers being the ones that focus more on productionization, but still with the uh, knowledge around the machine learning specialization. So not being as much of an expert as a data scientist is for data science, but same the other way around. 
So yeah, I mean, analogous to a full stack engineer uh, in software development, yeah. Okay, I mean, we can, if anyone has a really urgent question, or you can maybe catch Alejandro uh, in the break between the keynote, which is, by the way, on LLMs, so nice segue. Okay, well, uh, let's uh, give Alejandro a, a warm applause. Thank you.